We aim to do this by sharing solutions to common business problems, like the one you're going to see today, with the intent of accelerating the adoption of technology and innovation. We hope this will support other organizations in finding solutions that they need. Choose an initiative of the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. If you're interested in learning how you or your organization can be part of TRUE, please visit us at hec.org slash TRUE. I'd like to introduce the other organizations who helped to make TRUE events happen. The first is HEDC, or Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. It's a state agency that's attached to DBED, Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, and their mandate is to grow the tech economy and workforce in Hawaii. The Entrepreneur Sandbox is a second organization. It's a co-working facility in Kaka'ako, owned by HEDC and managed by Box Jelly. Before we begin, I just wanted to share some housekeeping rules. The session will be recorded and it will be sent to everyone who's registered. Please feel free to send in your questions during the session throughout the chat through the Q&A function. We'll address them during the Q&A following each section of the webinar. As our numbers continue to rise and there are changes with lockdown, we are faced with the difficult decision of how to maintain operations, earn a livelihood, and staying safe. Everyone talks about the new normal, but I don't think we're there yet. We're all still learning and adjusting. Combating this will take a combination of taking responsibility, a care for others, and a new solutions. Today, we'll hear about three technology solutions that can support the efforts to stem the spread of COVID in three very different areas, screening and surveillance, tracing and tracking, and social distancing and transparency. Again, we'll take Q&A after each session to allow time at the end for a whole panel discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Eddie Antai, president of Data House, a local consulting firm that has been delivering world-class solutions to customers for over 40 years. Eddie's responsible for all aspects of the business and strategic direction at Data House, and he'll be sharing surveillance and screening solutions that have been recently implemented at the airport and at the University of Hawaii. Eddie? Thanks, Michelle. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen. So yeah, I've um, been asked to, to share some of our experiences and what we've been doing uh, here in our community in Hawaii uh, as it relates to this area of um, of the solution of COVID. Um, and the interesting thing about this, this um, I guess if there is something interesting about this pandemic is that the reality is a lot of the solutions that we're starting to see and even what we're being a part of, it really didn't start till early March um, because that's when really the pandem pandemic became uh, much more um, worldwide and, and, and particularly impacting our community. So a lot of the technology uh, providers like ourselves We've all been learning um, as we go along and understanding the, the challenges of this solution or this, of this issue. Um, so it's been fascinating, you know, to be a part of that journey and, and just really understanding what the needs are and what possible solutions are leveraging technology. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about, um, you know, what we've been doing in this area called screening and surveillance. Um, but before I do that, I, I do want to talk about, um, start off with, um, just what are some of the challenges and the problems that, uh, that we're starting to, to hear and see and even experience ourselves uh, as we face COVID-19 within the, the whole screening and surveillance area? Um, you know, how can we mitigate uh, those that we deem at risk from coming onto my premises? So whether I'm a business, whether I'm a school, whether I'm a community, you know, how do I mitigate or at least provide some layer of assurances of, of not allowing those folks to come onto my into my property. Um, and then how do I know who's at risk? Um, it's not like I have COVID goggles and I can identify, you know, those that are potentially at risk and those aren't, right? Um, and then how do I assure those that are actually part of my community or my business or my school that they feel safe of others coming onto their campus or into their organization? If I'm a parent sending my child to school, how do I know that it's a safe environment for them to participate in that schooling? And then of course, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when someone does either get exposed or infected by the virus, 
how am I going to be able to assure that I can monitor that individual properly, especially during that 14 day quarantine? And then there's always going to be some reporting, particularly to our public health agency, and in this case, it's, a, it's the Hawaii Department of Health, um, where they do ask me to provide information for their purposes of contact tracing. You know, how do I provide that? And then last but not least, how do I do all of this at scale? <laughs> Um, I can't do everything with pencil and paper or through memorization, um, especially if we're talking about, you know, 50, 100, or tens of thousands of employees, visitors, or students. Um, that's almost impossible and very overwhelming, as we've heard from many of our clients and other organizations we've been working with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, several screening solutions um, that we've been a part of and have been hearing and seeing throughout the, the, the marketplace and in the community. And that's temperature readings, self-assessments, and, and, and being able to uh, integrate lab test results into as part of that screening effort. The first solution is really in the area of thermal uh, scanning solutions. And as you can see in this picture here, there's, there's three um, different devices that make up a, th a thermal scanning solution, at least the ones that we've been a part of. Uh, the first one, which is the most obvious one, is the thermal camera. So in this picture here, as you can see, the arrow pointing to this camera, it's actually uh, a camera that has infra uses infrared technologies to be able to detect uh, the body temperatures of some individual's uh, elevated uh, surface body temperature. Um, so it's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, there's a lot of different devices and cameras out there, some you know, relatively affordable, Others very expensive, depending on the type of use case that you're gonna be using it for. Uh, in this illustration, we also have what's called a black body device. And that's another uh, piece of equipment that goes along with the thermal camera. And it just provides another uh, uh, piece of, of accuracy to, to being able to detect the, uh, your, your body temperature. So in the case where, you know, especially if you're in an exterior or in an environment where there's multiple, uh, different temperatures in, in the environment, whether it be outside, whether it be indoors and it's air conditioned, you wanna have a, a baseline uh, so that you can get accurate readings of the actual body temperature. Um, and then lastly, it's the operator interface of the monitor to be able to track and see what actually is being detected for that individual or individuals in this case. So it's pretty basic. Um, I mean, again, there's, there's equipment, there's uh, software that's involved in this and it's being able to integrate them all together in terms of you know, how you, how you want to use this uh, for your particular situation. I'll give you the example that we've been a part of, which is um, you probably have seen in, in the newspaper. Uh, it's the uh, deployment of thermal, uh, thermal scanners or thermal uh, scanners throughout all of our uh, busiest airports in, in Hawaii. Uh, so I'll play this uh, video for you. Hawaii National Guardsmen who have been screening passengers at Daniel K. Inouye Airport have received a technological upgrade thanks to the new thermal imaging cameras installed by the Hawaii State Department of Transportation. The Hawaii Guardsmen who were activated in March to support the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic have been augmenting the airport fire department. Until recently, the screening was accomplished by a team of four to six soldiers and or airmen wielding manual thermometers. Passengers' temperatures are now monitored by the Hawaii National Guard soldiers and airmen via thermal imaging as the travelers and crew exit the jetway. This process cuts the footprint of the guardsmen down to two per flight and makes the process more efficient, all the while keeping everyone socially distanced. We're trying to make sure that anybody entering the state of Hawaii doesn't come in with a hot temperature running on that. We want to get that right away. National Guard plays a very important role because we only have 62 firemen here spread among three, three shifts and we wouldn't be adequately able to respond to any internal emergencies, building fires, aircraft emergencies if we didn't have the National Guard support. National Guard plays since March has played a typical role in enabling us to provide for the safety of Hawaii. The passengers' images are not saved to any system, and the image cache is automatically dumped after 15 to 30 minutes. This is Tech Sergeant Andrew Lee Jones. Yeah, so that's a great example of how we can utilize the technology um, in such a, a wide uh, and broad uh, use case, such as the, the, the airports throughout our state. Um, as you can see here, 
uh, we're deploying over 133 thermal cameras. Uh, actually, they have been deployed and are, are live today uh, throughout all of those uh, various gates and terminals. Um, but it does give a, a more efficient way to collect that information and to detect if any passengers that are coming off their plane doesn't have it does have an elevated uh, body temperature that would potentially put them at risk. Um, this slide here, just, just a, lot of, a lot of things here, but just maybe pay attention to the, the dotted red lines where it says main proposal. Uh, within there is basically the, the overall solution for the deployment at the airport. So right now we just finished uh, phase one and two, which involves the thermal cameras. Um, and the monitors that are being able to detect any elevated body temperatures. And then phase three, as you heard in the video, there's a, a facial imaging uh, component that allows for the uh, traffic flow that's coming through the airport and being able to, once, if an individual is, is detected with, with a high temperature, they're able to capture their image and track them throughout the airport so that someone can go and uh, pull them aside and, and and be able to do additional screenings for that individual. So it's really more for the purposes of identifying what is your use case and your traffic flow so that you can you know, feasibly be able to um, uh, address that individual who potentially is at risk. So, so that's the, um, the thermal screening. The other solution is a self-assessment solution. And I think many organizations are already starting to do this if they haven't already. Um, some. It's, it's manual where they just have a, uh, a notepad and people fill out a survey and, and turn that in before they come into the premises. Um, but others, there are some technology uh, being used, whether in the form of a mobile device or web-based uh, platform that uh, is able to capture some of that information. Essentially, it's, it's um, a set of questions that are generally aligned with CDC guidelines. Uh, which is really meant to produce uh, or prevent and, and reduce the transmission of the disease coming into your premises. Um, there is an assumption that there, the individual does this voluntarily um, and, and truthfully in terms of answering those questions. So there is a bit of personal accountability built into this or inherent into the solution. Uh, it does provide uh, someone on the company side to be able to administer the data that's coming in so they can track if there's anybody that does have potential risk um, items that they can uh, monitor that or follow up on that appropriately. Uh, obviously it has to be scalable if it's gonna be a technology solution um, that has the appropriate tech, uh, security requirements for that to keep some of the data um, uh, private. Um, and then last but not least, it does have to be uh, user friendly. Otherwise, you know, again, part of this is, is that the, the user is gonna to wanna to do this and not just for their own good, but for the, the greater good of the community that they're a part of. So it does have to be user friendly. It does have to be engaging and, and relatively easy to use for that person. Um, well, we've just recently launched um, at the University of Hawaii is, is a product called Lumicite Campus. And again, it's a, a pretty easy, lightweight solution that is mobile. It's a mobile device. You can download the app on the mobile store, uh, either on Apple or, or Google. Um, it is deployed throughout all 10 campuses statewide. Um, we did uh, architect it to be able to handle over 75,000 users every day. Uh, so it does have that scale. How does it work? Um, again, it's, it's, it's relatively easy and it has to be easy because if we want the students to use it every day, it's gotta be uh, user friendly. Um, but essentially it's a mobile application with daily check-ins. Uh, there are features for push, daily push notifications as a reminder uh, to do your daily check-ins. There's also a geofencing component that, uh, that actually triggers um, when the individual starts to approach the, the campus, uh, whatever island they're on, um, or whichever campus that they're designated to, it will trigger a notification that reminds them again that you need to do your check-in. Uh, so. There's also the back-end component uh, which is an administration dashboard. So depending on who's administering this, they'll be able to review the daily check-ins. So you know, who's doing it, who's not doing it. Uh, are there any at-risk individuals that pops up? Uh, also the ability to do manual push notifications if you need to notify the students or faculty or employees for anything. Uh, it also provides you statistics such as the usage, uh, compliance, um, 
but basically just more proactive communication in that sense. Here's a, a, a little bit more on the geofencing. Again, being able to program uh, the platform depending upon which uh, campus or location that, that your facility is at, you'd be able to uh, program that geocode so that when individuals do approach that, uh, it'll automatically trigger a notification to remind them to check in. And then lastly is the lab test results. Again, this could be another component within the application or the platform. Uh, it just gives another assurance that uh, the individual coming to the premise you know, has taken a, a test, hopefully recently, uh, whether it be positive or negative, but it be able to share, share that result uh, with the organization. Um, so having features such as either uploading uh, a lab result um, or being able to scan it and where there's some automated way to convert the lab tests. If you know the lab test is usually about a four or five page long report. Um, so you would need to have some conversion to discern whether or not the outcome is negative or positive. Um, if you wanna do interfaces with laboratories, that can also happen, uh, but you would have to uh, abide by HIPAA compliance, um, usually using HL7 standards, which is the clinical interface for that. And then lastly, um, just to, to talk about some of the governance and legal considerations. You know, every client that we've been talking to about this area, um, it usually involves HR and legal department. And these are just several of the, the, the considerations or questions that they have related to you know, the overall solution, the overall issue and problems that they're dealing with. Uh, do we make it mandatory or is this an optional uh, process for our students or our, our employees? Do we need to get consents from them? Um, are there privacy issues? Uh, HIPAA, you know, is always a big one. And then what are the liabilities? Again, like I said, it's not a matter of if your uh, constituents, your employees, students, staff get the, the virus or exposed to a virus, it's a matter of when. And if they are, what are the liabilities to the organization? Um, so that's it. Um, again, um, appreciate any questions or, or comments you have. Um, again, this has uh, been a, a journey for all of us and I do appreciate the, the time to be able to share this with you all. Thanks, Eddie. A couple of questions came in. First one is, is UH actively using this? Yes, great question. They actually just went live this past Monday. So all their students as they're returning back are required to, to do their daily check-ins as well as the staff and the faculty. Is Loomis site going to be mandatory or is it an optional? So the university early on had decided uh, that they were gonna make this mandatory. So in order to return to campus or return to school for that matter, uh, they are required to do their daily check-in. So that's a consideration that every organization will need to ask themselves, whether it's gonna be mandatory or optional. Okay, and then last question for um, people who do opt in for Lumisite, who manages the back end or who, who watches the um, results? Yeah, again, it's, it, that's going to depend upon every organization, uh, depending on how much data that you do collect. Uh, that could be fairly sensitive information. So you really have to take that into consideration. Uh, for the University of Hawaii, they've definitely regulated who uh, is able to see that to a very finite number of individuals. Okay, um, thank you, Eddie. I think um, we'll have we'll save some of the questions for after the presentations. Um, but okay. thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. So, thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Brandon. Brandon's the president of IO Digital. He oversees two digital companies, Upspring, and a digital consultancy and. Library Creative, a creative design firm for the IO family of companies. Brandon Carisu and IO Digital have been actively working on various COVID related initiatives, including Aloha Trace, a syndromic surveillance tool. Today, Brandon will be sharing a digital contact tracing and tracking solution that he's been collaborating, collaborating with the Department of Health on. Brandon? Thanks, Michelle, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Oh, 
Okay. So uh, today I'll be talking about a couple of uh, digital contact tracing applications that uh, we've been working on with the uh, Hawaii State Department of Health. Uh, you know, back in April, we had created a, uh, a syndromic surveillance tool called Aloha Trace. And uh, with that, you know, we developed a relationship with the uh, Department of Health. And through this relationship, you know, we started uh, collaborating on uh, a couple of digital contact tracing applications, Aloha Safe Story and Aloha Safe Alert. Uh, and, you know, we look at Aloha Safe as a, it's a, a true public private partnership, you know, with the Department of Health and on the right side of, of the screen, you can kind of see our, um, our supporters from the private sector and from the community. Uh, Central Pacific Bank Foundation, uh, HEC, True, Everyone Hawaii, uh, AIO, and, um, and of course, Aloha Trace. So both applications, um, <clears throat> we are basing on a open source uh, platform from uh, PathCheck Foundation. And PathCheck is a, uh, it's a nonprofit founded out of MIT. And they've really been, uh, you know, working closely with our team as well as the Department of Health to, to roll these apps out. And um, right now they're, they're close to rolling their platform out in, in several other states and countries as well. I can't say which um, at this time, but um, you know, they're, they're rolling out several uh, states and, and countries now. So the two uh, contact tracing applications that we're working on uh, with the Department of Health are, uh, there's a GPS application and a Bluetooth application. So the GPS application is more, uh, it's location based. So it's more, you know, where you've been. And <clears throat> the way it works is uh, if you think about it, like, you know, you had a, a notepad and you sort of wrote down where you were every few minutes. That's, that's how this application functions. So, uh, you know, it runs in the background of your phone and it's logging your, your location every few minutes. And it's just your, your latitude, your longitude and, and the time. There's no other uh, identifiable uh, data being captured. So not even your, not your phone number, not your device ID. Um, it's just latitude, longitude and time. And the data is, is only stored on your device. So it's not going up to you know, a, a central server. Um, and the only way the data leaves your device is if you choose to share it with the, with the contact tracer. Um, and I'll kind of go through the flow of this um, a little bit later. The Bluetooth application um, is more device to device. So it's more who you've been exposed to. And I'm sure you've heard, uh, you know, in the news that Google and Apple <clears throat> have uh, partnered together to create their digital contact tracing um, solution called the Google Apple Exposure uh, Notification. And, um, you know, this protocol right now is, it's embedded on every uh, iOS and Android device. It's in the operating system. So, um, and Hawaii, <clears throat> there's only one key per state or country level that Google and Apple is giving out. And they're only giving the key to, to the uh, public health authority of that state or country. So the, uh, the Hawaii Department of Health is the only entity that can get that key and, and they have the key, so um, we are working on developing this application for them. I'll talk a little bit about it uh, uh, further down. So this is the um, Aloha State story, which is the GPS application. And the way 
the way that this application is being marketed or will be marketed is just as a memory aid. Um, you know, GPS should, should never be used as a notification tool because it's not, uh, it's not accurate. Um, so we're only marketing this as a memory aid. <clears throat> so like I said, you know, the, the app will log your location every few minutes. The data never leaves your device. And on the right here, you can kind of see the, the process. So, you know, an individual was tested and he's confirmed positive. Then he'll go through his usual contact tracing interview. The contact tracer will ask him, hey, do you have any data on your past whereabouts in the past 14 days? And right now it's, it's hard, you know, because a lot of these guys are, they're not feeling well, they have fevers. Uh, they can't remember where they were uh, yesterday, you know, not, not just 14 days ago. Uh, but, you know, with this application, they're able to just push a button and send their location data, anonymous location data to the contact tracer, which really will make the, the whole contact tracing process um, more efficient and, and more accurate. Um, so the, uh, we've trained um, a couple of the lead investigators for the Department of Health and they will be training the, the contact tracers on, on how to accept and process this, this data. There's also, um, this could also be used for quarantine or isolation monitoring. Um, you know, the, the sick quarantine, not, not the travel quarantine, but this is something that's also being uh, discussed. So again, you know, main points for a lot of safe story, the GPS memory aid, is that this is just a memory aid tool and you know, it's not a notification tool. It's not going to notify you if you went to Safeway uh, Kapahulu and there was a, a confirmed case at Safeway Kapahulu. You're not going to be notified because, um, you know, it that will lead to too many uh, false notifications. You know, the data never leaves your device unless you choose to share it. Only the latitude, longitude, and time are recorded. Uh, the app just is running in the background and uh, we feel as well as the Department of Health feels that this tool will really help to make the, the tracing process more efficient. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Aloha Safe Alert, which is based on uh, the game protocol. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of you have seen this, uh, you know this illustration, but it kind of explains how how it works. So, you know, Alice and Bob are sitting on a bench. They're talking to each other for ten minutes, and while they're talking to each other, their devices are sending little pings to each other. Uh, it's just like a, a gibberish code that that each device is saying, "Hey, I'm here," and "Hey, you're here." So say, you know, Bob is positively diagnosed, he doesn't feel well, and he's contacted by the uh, Department of Health contact tracer. Uh, it's, it would be the same process where the, the contact tracer would give Bob a six digit code. Bob would enter that code in his app and send his, uh, the keys on his device of everyone that he's been exposed to, that would be sent up to uh, the key server. And it, again, it's all anonymous. There's no identifying um, information on there. And Alice, her phone <coughs> is period periodically checking this server to see if there's been any new positive uh, you know, exposures. And if Alice 
her interaction with Bob <clears throat> meets a certain set of criteria, then Alice would, would be notified on her phone saying, hey, uh, you may have been exposed, so you might want to contact your primary care physician or, or get tested or whatever. This is um, the Department of Health will determine that. And so what I mean by certain criteria is that you know, Bluetooth is, is also not accurate, 100% accurate for, for notifications, meaning, um, you know, Bob and I could be sitting in, in adjacent offices with our doors closed and there's a wall in between us and we're not exposing each other to anything, but our, our devices will be talking through the wall. So, you know, one of the, um, one of the levers, I guess, is signal strength. And um, this is something that will be, you know, optimized through testing of the application. A certain signal strength would, would be required for this person to be notified. So that's one lever. Another lever is the distance between the devices. And uh, the last one is the length of exposure. And so, there's going to be a, a criteria with these three different levers and um, you know a person will be notified if they meet all three criteria and that's how the Department of Health is looking at um, you know really reducing the amount of false notifications so just a recap on gain the main points uh, you know, everybody has it on their on your phone. It just needs to be activated, and you know they say that's a third of the world's population, which is you know that's that's a lot of people. Uh, in order to access the protocol, you need the key through an application. There's only one key given out, and the Department of Health um, is the only entity that can get that key, and they have it for Hawaii. Uh, Gain uses low energy Bluetooth, so you know it doesn't drain the battery on your phone. Users can also control whether or not they receive notifications, so you can opt in or opt out uh, anytime you want. And you know, again, Gain does not track location; it's just who you've been exposed to. And you know, a lot of people have been asking, you know, why can't you combine GPS? and Bluetooth together, uh, blue, uh, GPS and gain together in one app. And that would be the optimal solution, but um, you know, Google and Apple are, they're adamant about keeping the two technologies separate because uh, if you combine the two, it's, it's almost like true surveillance. So, you know, there's a lot of um, data privacy issues that, um, you know, that, uh, keeping them separate, you know, helps to address. Um, so, you know, gain has been uh, really gaining traction. Uh, this list here, you can see some of the countries and states that have apps either in development or uh, recently released. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the the, the real uh, interesting part is that APHL, the Association of Public Health Laboratories, they're working with Google, Apple, and Microsoft uh, to create a national key server. So, you know, this, this will bridge contacts across all participating states in the United, in the, in the nation. So, you know, regardless of if I have a uh, Virginia app or if I have the Hawaii app, and I go to Virginia, our, our devices will all be talking to everybody that has it there. So they're also, you know, discussing a, a international key server, which would, which would make gain a, a global tracing uh, solution. So, uh, yeah, th th that's all I have. Uh, thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Brandon.
Um, just one question for you so far. Um, how helpful is the Aloha Safe Suite if only a certain number of people use it? And what might be critical mass to make a difference in contact tracing success? Yeah, so for gain, they're saying, um, you know, they said like 60% of the population, if 60% of the population were to adopt it, it would be really effective. Um, but on the GPS side, it, it doesn't really matter how many people, I mean, it, it does matter how many people uh, use it, but it's more of an individual tool that, um, that you use to, to help the contact tracer. So if you have, you know, 50% or 80% or using the GPS tool, I don't think it, um, it would make a, a big difference. Thank you, Julie, for that question. Thank you, Brandon. Um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Takaho Iwasaki, the president and CEO of Meiji Connection and the founder of Island Innovation Demo Day, a pitch event that provides opportunities for Hawaii startups to match with Japanese investors and corporate partners. Her firm bridges a gap between Japan and Hawaii and brings innovative solutions from Japanese to Hawaii and vice versa. Today, she's sharing a social distancing and transparency solution developed by Vakan. Takaho? Hi, thank you for joining everybody. Let me pull up this presentation. Michelle, are you looking at the presentation? I am, but I see the speaker view. Okay. okay. How about now? Great. Perfect. Okay. okay. Hi, uh, my name is Takahoi Wasaki. Today I'm going to present Vakans, technology that can help you to create organic social distances for you, for you business, employees, and clients. Social distance is very important and one of the few ways to prevent spreading coronavirus. It is very hard to manage. In order to create social distance, you have to avoid indoor closed areas, crowded places, and close contact. However, not all facilities have a wide and open area. For, for, for smaller stores, the only way to keep social distance between customers is to limit at the number of people. But it's very hard. Your customer turnover is not very efficient, and you have to make your customers wait outside if your store is full capacity. Managing social distance in these lines is also challenging. Even if you create social distance in your store, some customers are not comfortable to wait in a line with strangers and there's a high possibility that they leave, so you will lose the business opportunity. With all of these problems, your customers' frustration getting higher and higher. From business standpoint, operation is getting harder and harder. In addition to managing social distance for employees and customers, they have to go over complicated hygiene protocols, which are costly and time consuming. Even if they follow all the protocols, they will have a hard time getting customers to come in because people are so scared to go out and be exposed to the virus by making contact with other people. The business has no way to inform the customer how they manage social distance and keep hygiene protocol to reduce the risk of coronavirus. Backend's technology can solve this problem. This technology monitors a facilities area and visualizes the foot traffic and the congestion status to any platform by using a combination of various types of sensors and cameras. AI to analyze the data from monitoring and IoT, which is uh, convenient to users and both businesses and its clients. Backend's technology can help you and your business managing social distance more easily by distributing people's traffic evenly from business to business with the information of wait times and congestion status in advance. It creates organic social distance without the frustration. Bakan is a Japanese startup that was funded by Takanobu Kawano in 2016. 
He built this company because he wants to reduce customers' frustration that is caused by waiting in efficiently in line for long. Also, he wants to help business owners to improve operating efficiency and customer turnover. Even before COVID-19, their technology has been used in many large department store chains, building management offices, transportation companies, and airport to improve customer experiences, especially in the place with the large food traffic and congestion. Let me explain how Vacuum technology is used with a case study in Japan. First case is about the department store located in Tokyo. As you know, there is a lot of foot traffic going in the department stores in Japan. Usually customers have to go to each restaurant, food court, and the resting places one by one to see how many available seats there are or how busy it is. If there is no available seats, customer has to wait in a line until the seats are available, and that increases customer's frustration. Department store management had to come up with a new idea to manage foot traffic and the waiting times. So they used Vacan's technology. They set off the use multiple sensors, including cameras to monitor foot traffic in the facility. This video footage, the new medical data is sent to Vacan's AI and analyze it in real time. And then they visualize the data through API to any convenient platform to their clients. The department stores can let customers avoid a crowded place by notifying which stores are busy or full versus which has space in the real time. With Bakan's technology, the department store is able to create organic social distance between customers by distributing them evenly in the building. Also, this helps to increase the average revenue of the total facility by improving efficiency of rotation and the distribution of food traffic. This technology has been used at the department stores in Japan since Bakan was funded, but the, since COVID-19, the demand of this technology is getting higher and higher because business can have their customer avoid making close contact with each other and prevent the potential cluster. Since the pandemic, Bakan has provided additional services at the, these department stores. Before COVID-19, there were customers waiting in line to ask a cosmetic advisor tr to try or to buy product they want. Due to COVID-19, there was a need to handle this customer's consultation with a line in order to avoid gathering people in a close place. So Vacan started a digital queue service at the cosmetic area. This is how it works. Customer gets a digital queue ticket via a store tablet or their own smartphone. Customer don't have to be there so they can enjoy shopping in other areas while they're waiting. Customer receive a lot before it, it is their time. So there's no physical line at the area. So customers do not have the frustration of waiting too long or being concerned of spreading getting COVID-19. Uh, recently, many hotels have started to use vacans to make ho uh, hotel operation easier, especially for customer social distance management. This helps customers to have a better overall experiences. <clears throat> Let me explain one, one use case in hotel located in Kagoshima, Japan. This resort has a very popular hot spring on onsen, large pool, which is cloud in the summer, and the three restaurants and the many other facility. Pre-COVID, guests could go whenever they want, as long as the facility was open, and it was not necessary to manage the number of people in, the, in each spot. Since the pandemic, the hotel management has to control the number of people inside each of hotel, hotel facilities, and secure the guests' privacy, especially as they're naked inside a hot spring. So the hotel uses vacant technology. They install either sensor or manual input and system to manage the number of people who use the facility. After vacants analyze the data, the foot traffic congestion status is visualized and output in the TV screen at each room. Each gets a smartphone via QR code and are displayed at the same locations in the hotel. 
Guests are available to see each facility capacity and usage in real time. So guests can manage their visual experiences without frustration while they keep social distance from other guests. Backend is also helping the restaurant industry in Japan. One of the first example is Fukuoka city. After Japanese government loosened its tough lockdown, a lot of restaurants are still struggling because their customers didn't come back since they're scared to be exposed to the coronavirus. So Fukuoka Russian organization used the backend technology to help those businesses. So with the Fukuoka Russian organization support, Backend provided their manual input service for free. In the manual input service, restaurant manager can easily input the number of people in the restaurant, the capacity is with the social distance and their hygiene initiative and the status. Their information is visualized on the map of Fukuoka City, which Bakan created. This helps restaurant business to promote their availabilities and how they are preventing hygiene issues in the restaurant. Also, this helps restaurants operating efficiency by distributing the number of customers over all of the business hours. For customers, they can feel safer to walk in the restaurant by avoiding close contact and crowded restaurant or make sure if they have outside seats or not, even if they don't make a reservation. If the restaurant likes Bakan, they can add other service like the e-ticket service, which I explained at the department cosmetic section, and the last minute re reservation service, which was started recently. Right now, a lot of restaurants are using Bakan service, and this Bakan map has been expanding to all over Japan from Okinawa to Sapporo. Also, their service has been expanding to other industries and businesses. This service has started to be used in more public facility or touristy place such as a museum to provide a safer and a secure hospitality with a social distance to the customers. Currently, Bakan service has been used only in Japan, China, and Taiwan. But don't worry, we are already starting to do some trial project in Hawaii and are ready to enter the Hawaii market to help Hawaii's economy. Since we are still in the uh, trial phase, uh, phases, Bakan is offering a tremendous discount and uh, some free service in Hawaii. If you are interested in, please feel to contact me. Bakan's technology can be used in hotel, shopping center, restaurants, retails, and condominium management too. Don't forget that Bakan is not just made for combating the pandemic. Even if we can completely go back to pre-COVID normal, this technology is very useful for customers' care and operating efficiency. We are not sure what the new normal is going to look like, but the social distance is definitely an important factor to activize economy. I would appreciate if you consider usage of technology to push your economy by using technology such as a backup. Great, thank you, Takaho. Um, a question for you, who else is, who has shown some interest in using Vakan here in Hawaii? Uh, I started to talk some uh, condominium management. Hmm. Also, uh, I started to talk to the hotel um, because I think a lot of the Hawaii hotel has like a pool, restaurant, and then they kind of trying to focus on how to manage the food traffic in the facility. And also, I talked to uh, some shopping center too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I know that, um, you know, with the lockdown and different changes, it, it may not be as immediately relevant. Can you share maybe why people should start this process now? Uh, so I think this is a very chicken and egg program. Mm -hmm. uh, people are so scared to, well, not until during the lockdown, after the, after the lockdown, people are so scared to go out because they're not sure um, like the status of the hygiene in the restaurant or if it's crowded or not. But then if they started to have those information in advance, they can feel more comfortable. And for the restaurant business side, maybe it's too early to install it. 
But then if you don't have those, uh, in, um, the system that the can inform to the customer, they cannot have the customer forever. And even people coming back, I think if you start to um, installing those technology, when the startup people start coming back, um, mm -hmm. it's too late. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I ask the other panelists to um, turn on their camera and we'll just go into a Q&A for everybody? Thank you everybody for, for the informative presentations and we know that things are changing pretty rapidly. Um, so this definitely helps. One of the questions that's coming in is, uh, what's the biggest challenge for implementing GAIN in Hawaii? And this is a question from Christine. Thanks, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess the biggest challenge that I've seen so far is, is just trying to explain to people how it works. <laughs> you know, it's such a, a new technology and, um, you know, and trying to uh, convince people that, you know, the government is not monitoring you, they're not tracking you. Um, so I think that's gonna be, uh, you know, a hurdle that, um, that we're gonna have to get over, but uh, hopefully, you know, we can put out some, some really good informational uh, pieces online or um, even uh, through some marketing efforts. Great, thank you. And then as a follow-up to that, Rena asked, um, who selects which way to go, whether we go GPS or GAIN? Or is this something that's a combination? Oh yeah, I mean, it should be a combination. Um, so everybody should have the GPS app and the GAIN app on their phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And then Eddie, for something like a Luma site and for the thermography, how has the reception been? Um, well, so far at the airport, it's it's pretty, um, you know, most, most of the passengers coming off the, the flight, they don't really realize it. And that's why we have to put these big, big, bold signs there to let them know. Um, but as far as the, um, the Luma site uh, self-screening app, um, so far so good. Um, you know, I just went live with uh, a couple organizations, uh, 1K12 and as I mentioned, UH. So uh, crossing figures, no problems yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And then for Takaho, um, has Vikan started their operations here in Hawaii? Are they able to um, execute if someone's interested in Yes, we're ready to execute it. But then, as I said, uh, we, we, this is very new to Hawaii. Um, so we have go over some couple trial phases, which all the technology needed. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, the team is very, um, how do you say, very prepared mm -hmm. and the very quick response. Great. Yeah. And this is a question for everybody. Do you think these solutions are here to stay or will they disappear after the pandemic? <laughs> Hopefully disappear. <laughs> okay, that's for the. I think it's going to probably evolve. Would be my my guess. Just like any other technology. Um, for the backend technology, as I said, it was not made for the virus. It's more like customer experiences. Uh, so maybe even the virus is gone. Um, maybe the those need of the technology to take care of the customer experience, especially Hawaii has a lot of Japanese tourists who has a very high expectation of the high uh, customer care. Um, also, I think um, um, a lot of people will not be comfortable to go to cloudy place for, for even after vaccine. So I think this kind of technology will stay long. Great, thank you. And then how difficult is it to install the system to Kahoo? So it's very depends. If you wanna have a full service and have, wanna have a camera sensor to make it everything automatic, uh, maybe we need a, like maybe a month and a couple of months to install it and then to kind of test it out. But for the manual input, uh, uh, we kind of talk it maybe, maybe first one will be like one month to test it in Hawaii, but then after that, it's gonna be very like, like maybe a week or like five days or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, yeah. And what's the usage in Japan? So when they rolled it out? Um, so it's very wide, 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 so it's like a very various way. 
So I think the, um, the case study that I presented is some of the popular way. Um, and they, I heard a, a lot of uh, marine museum, the museum, those public touristy places to install them. Cause it's kind of like uh, also it's promotion to them. Like, hey, now it's available. You don't have to book now. You can come and then you can enjoy mm -hmm. our facility with the social distance. Uh, so um, it's actually, I, I couldn't tell the what, how many numbers business doing, uh, but then it's quite uh, surprising how many kind of restaurants uh, the business is using in Japan. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of um, Disneyland and the fast pass. Yes, <laughs> we can go back. Basically, fast pass to any businesses. <laughs> and then, Brandon, what, what is the planned deployment for your two apps? When? What, yeah. Um, so, uh, the GPS app has been approved in both the Apple and Google Play stores. So, uh, right now, we're in beta testing. Um, and so that's, you know, will be, will be soon. Uh, the gain app is, is largely dependent on, um, on APHL and when their national server is ready. So we are told that this will be the end of September. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of getting everything ready. So we're also shooting for that date and, um, I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to see a lot of the gain apps, like state, uh, country gain apps roll out uh, around that time as well, because the APHL server will be, um, will be up and ready. Okay, thank you. And then how many of these are local solutions? Eddie, you want to start? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, the thermal the thermal scanner is a it's an NEC solution, um, so leveraging their their software platform, um, and there's many components to it in terms of the the, the cameras themselves. Um, as far as the Lumisite, that is a local homegrown solution. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And then for something like NEC and thermography, are you seeing that going into businesses, or is it limited to the airports? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's many use cases for that. They have it at casinos, they have it at hotels. Um, it just depends on what the use case is mm -hmm. and how far they want to take it. Okay. And then Brandon, for the Aloha Safe Suite, is that developed locally? Uh, no, so we're using uh, an open source platform from uh, PathCheck, which is, uh, they're out of MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd say they're the market leader for, um, you know, open source uh, digital contact tracing technology. Okay, and then Takaho, yours is Japanese. All made yeah. in Japan. <laughs> and, but then it'll help, uh, we'll find local integrators to support, yeah? Yes, um, and also we are very open to any joint venture. If the, you have a technology that want to collaborate with Takan, I'm pretty open to any ideas. Okay, great. I wanted to thank you guys. Thank you to all the speakers who are so generous with their time and information. Um, and thank you everyone for the great questions. To close out, um, just wanted to remind you, oops, let me bring up that screen. Just wanted to remind you that the session is being recorded and we'll share that with you via an email. Um, there's also a survey link that should be popping up in the chat box. Um, if you could, please complete the survey so we can continue to share solutions and information based on your needs. And then of course, we welcome any feedback um, that you may have as we work to bring value to you and your organizations. I'd like to highlight three upcoming TRUE events that may be of interest. The first um, is that the pandemic has created a need for cloud-based call center solutions. Now that most workforces are dispersed, um, Adrian Chi of Central Pacific Bank will be sharing their Amazon Connect solution on September 10th. And when I say share, I don't mean just lessons learned, but the whole solution, processes, roadmap, and all. Um, the second event is around the customer. Work from home has changed the way we interact with our customers. Peter Dewar from Servco will be sharing how Servco has a 360 view of their customers, from knowing them 
to data analytics to how they market to them. The tools that he'll be um, going through and sharing include Imperity, Tableau, and Salesforce Marketing Cloud. And then True focuses on providing and sharing solutions. True is vendor agnostic. We acknowledge that there's more than one way to solve a problem. The third event will highlight customer care solution, including a help desk um, that two state agencies have put into place with Salesforce. They each had a very different approach. One started small, one started um, big, but they each achieved the goal. If you're interested in learning more about these solutions or in learning more about how you can be involved with True, please go again to hec.org slash true. I look forward to more collaboration as we face multiple challenges from combating the pandemic to diversifying Hawaii's economy to accelerating and adoption, the adoption of technology and innovation to make our organizations more productive and competitive. Again, I wanted to thank you all for joining us today and for your continued support. Take care and stay safe. Thank you guys. Aloha. Aloha, bye.